And then once they get going, they're like, "Well, oh, we're the Cowboys. How about them Cowboys? And here we go. What if they're all talking like that? I know. The huddle. Well, that was my that was my Texas <laughs> accent. I did. I did live down there just for a little in that while. Huddle, how about them Cowboys? How about that, like Cowboys? just saying that back and forth to each other. Yo, 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 what's up? It's back to Chris Sims, New Jersey voice. That's right. I'm here. The Northeasterner accent. The mall call. I'm from New Jersey. Yeah. That's how we talk up here. Okay. But uh, just having a little fun. It's the Chris Sims Unbutton podcast. My man Ahmed Fareed's here. Let me hear your Texas twang. Do you have a Texas twang? You don't swear. Yeah. But let me hear your Texas twang. Remember Let's hear it. Remember it was it. my snap count from like two years ago. Red four, red four. That's my Texas. That's He's a, a quarter, a high school quarterback <laughs> in Texas. That's what he is there. Did is you, that the one you went with at quarterback? Would you do red four a lot? Uh, you were red four yeah, guy? that was my. That was that my was your one. Yeah. That was your audible. Yeah, that yeah. was my. Yeah, into red formation. Red formation. No, no? <laughs> I think we had it super simple in high school. It was just go. Go. I would just go up to that. We had no audibles. Right. We had no dummy Ready, calls. Ready, set, go. Exactly. <laughs> one exactly. of those. Yeah. Okay. We were one of those right. teams. <laughs> Awesome. Did, did you ever have a New Jersey accent? I, I did. I did. I, it, it, You've kind of gotten rid of it, it's, right? I, like m- the the movement around the country definitely neutralize it. It's one of the things I get from people a lot when they meet me and yeah. I say I'm from New Jersey. They go, oh, you don't have an accent. And I go, yeah, I guess between being Texas, Nashville, Colorado, Tampa, all those places, it's kind of like negated it a little bit. Uh-huh. Uh, every now and then I hear it pop out. But I know... I know I don't speak like that because when I hear my family talk and I'm on the phone or something like that, I hear it from them and I'm like, yeah. oh, I, I don't sound like that anymore. It's no longer me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. There's a little bit of a Midwestern accent that comes out with me every once in a while. Yeah, yeah, right. Like the A's, that, like Elon, yes. Elon gets nasally kind of up in sure, there. Sure, yeah. I know. It's, I, it's like, it's what is that accent up there? What What is it classified? Uh, it's almost like can, it's a little Canadian-ish. Canadian twang-ish a to it, bit, right? Yeah. You have like the Minnesota where they always go like the the Ooper Peninsula, yeah. right? Oh, don't you know? Don't yeah. you know, right? Yeah. And then like Chicago has a little of its own little... Uh-huh. You know, uh, I, how do I want to say it? You know, I, I, I know. Bears. Yeah, dub bears. My like sausage that. patty links. Like, it's yeah. like, I don't, but it, it's, it's, it is its own thing for but sure. But same thing. Like, I've worked in New Jersey. Yeah. Like MLB Network out in California. So yeah. I had to kind of like get, get rid of it. Right. It was standing out, especially what I called uh, soda pop. Oh, you call it pop. I right. call it. We, yeah, that's definitely Midwest. We all call it yeah. pop. Pop is such a Midwest thing. And then I you know. move out of Michigan or the Chicago and every, area. No one calls it pop. What are you talking pop? about? Pop. Right. Pop. Right. You're a lesser human being than me. <laughs> Stop Pretty doing much. that. <laughs> <laughs> or if you get to the Northeast, everybody just calls it all Coke. They call it all Coke. No matter what it is. They're like, you have, it's Coke. You want a Coke? Yeah. And you mean like, oh, do, a ginger ale? Sure, I'll take it. Everyone like in the South. Coke. Like in the South, kind of, right? You well, think they do that up here, well, too? I feel like they do sometimes. I feel like Coke is like just the, yeah. it's a carbonated drink. I remember I, I, was in, I was in Nashville one time, and I go, I'll, I'll have a Coke. And they go, okay, cool. Which kind? Yeah, you're right. right. <laughs> and I go, uh, Pepsi? Uh, like, okay, <laughs> we got it. That's exactly. <laughs> cool. That's what I mean. It, it does go around. Me. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, accents aside. Accents aside. Maybe they'll come out. Yeah. Maybe, maybe part of it you'll get fired up. Uh, That's yeah. when your New it Jersey happens. accent it comes happens. out. You lose it. Big Phil lost his Kentucky accent living in New Jersey uh, all these it's years. Shame. Yeah, it's, it's gone. It's gone. He's got no more Kentucky twang. So maybe it'll come out as we talk about what happened on Sunday with What the F Happened Wednesday. Or if you got kids in the car right now, it's Treasure Hunters. Yeah. We're looking for nuggets, treasure. Chris went into the lab again, looked at all the film for these games that we're going to highlight here today. It's good stuff. Some, some good revelations. Stuff. We did get some yeah. good stuff. And right. so, like when I read it every week, it's like I get a preview and Pete gets a preview. There are always things I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I, we haven't talked about that before. This all is right. a different way good. to see this quarterback or this team or this yeah. offense. Right. Or that was interesting. This defense did that. So we'll do that with Tua, of course, and Justin Herbert to start here. Brock Purdy, a little closer look at what he's doing Definitely. for the 49ers. Dak Prescott's been a little inconsistent here lately. So let's take a closer look at him. Uh, the Ravens got that running game going again, which is huge for them. The Panthers have a running game going. And Definitely do. Some other things to on, too. Yeah, for so sure. So we have a whole lot of things to get to here. Uh, so let's get right into it. With our Sunday night football game, we looked a little deeper into this one because it warranted it. Yep. Chargers and Dolphins. Chargers won this one. was not a good day for Tua. We'll get to Tua and, and a look at that offense. But I wanted to start with Justin Herbert here. Yeah, yeah. Because we've given him a lot of love on this podcast, right? right? You've been in the, He's the man. leader of the, the, the conductor and the choo-choo for right. Justin Herbert for right. a long time. Yep. But I, I think the, the country here, if he can make a run here, 
and he can get this team. You, you did it for Joe Burrow, right? You're like, let's throw his name into the MVP conversation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, probably Justin Herbert's not far behind because they've had injuries. Exactly right. And it is all on his right arm. Yes. So you've got some really cool notes in here. Let's start with two stats and a lie just to highlight how good he's okay, been here. I so like let's it. quiz you. All right. All right. So two of these stats are true. One is a lie on Justin Herbert. Okay. He is second in the NFL in passing yards. Okay. He is second in the NFL in passer rating. He has the second lowest air yards per completed pass in the NFL. Which of those is a lie? Well, I feel like the bottom one, the air yards completed pass, is true. Correct. I and I feel like the top one is true that he's second in NFL passing. I mean, because they can't, they don't run the ball that well. So I'm going to say that's that he's not second in passer rating. Right. You're three for three in this game. Boom. You nailed that one again. You're right. Second in passing yards to Patrick Mahomes. Uh, Mahomes has 4,100. Herbert second, 3,700. Yeah. Uh, You're right on that uh, air yards per completed pass. Right. Just four. One of my complaints we've talked about. Hundred percent. Yeah. Only Kyler Murray of qualified quarterbacks has a lower air yard per completed pass. Two of the stronger arms in football. Exactly. That's why they're dropping the ball with how their offenses are organized around them right now. And and with the Chargers case, as you explained, the injuries are certainly a, a part of this. And he is 12th in passer rating. The top three being Hertz, Tua, and Geno Smith. Yeah. Going into the year, if you would have said that, right, which doesn't maybe, even sound right. It's like, huh? <laughs> highlights, you know, passer rating as a, as a stat a little bit. But yeah. they've been successful in their offenses for no sure. No question. They've taken advantage of what they what's there to be had, and they they played good football. But yeah, it's it's you know compared to those three guys you just mentioned at the top of the passer rating, uh, Herbert's climbing a, a much steeper hill as far as weekly challenges and things he has to overcome. Let alone his own injury let alone one of the least protected quarterbacks in football the injuries at receiver one of the least like separation from coverage his receivers in all of football if he's not the, if it isn't the worst I believe it was like second or third worst than football so it's it's all those things are speaking to yeah things are not that easy but he gets it done and that's because he is an incredible talent, and as I said when we did the quarterback rankings, for me, when you just talk about pure in-the-pocket passing, he's the best pure in-the-pocket passer in football. When he can stand there and has a little room and somebody's open by just a little, it's bullseye every time. You know, He's not as good at the, like, the sidearm stuff or maybe extending plays and doing some of that stuff like Mahomes and Allen and Burrow, mm-hmm. uh, but man, just pure passer in the pocket it's bullseye almost every time he throws the damn ball so a couple of things you said there yeah. that stand out from your notes right. you, you noted the wide receivers you you didn't think they were getting a whole lot of separation out no. there in this game once again but the thing that you mentioned right there about him in the pocket when yeah. he gets a little bit of time right now that is not always because it's great pass protection right. what did you notice about his ability in the pocket well, the, 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 the thing that blew me away going back and watching on film that I wish I would have hit harder on the post game show on Sunday night football. And again, you know, you're watching so much stuff. It's live game. And, you know, sometimes you're trying to figure out everything else to where I just, I watch the game and I'm here. We are three, four series in and I'm going, he's making somebody miss every time he drops back to pass, then throws the ball. Oh, gets pressure, dips out of the pocket, makes somebody miss, throws the ball. Oh, somebody's around him, moved in the pocket, throws a strike. Oh, he's got people hanging around all over him, and most quarterbacks would get antsy and go, oh, no, I got to run or get out of here. He just stands there, stays strong, roar, throws the ball down the middle. So that is like, I guess I didn't really give him the credit for the pressure he was under that night and how well he moved to avoid some of it at times. And then we just go, oh, good play, good play. But, you know, it's, it's one of those where you sit there in peace and quiet and you go, no, that's not a good play. That was phenomenal right there that he did that. And he did that through throughout the night, which was really impressive. We have a graphic on that. He was pressured on 44% of his dropbacks. He completed 13 of the 20 passes, 185 yards, you know, nine yards per pass attempt. So that just goes to show you how yeah. effective he was even when he had to move around. Yeah, exactly pocket. right. He's, he's got great movement ability. It's probably the one thing I would say I wish he would do more, right? You've heard me say that a little bit. Because he's such a great pocket passer, at times I think, oh, you know, I think he just stands there too long to where you're like, man, you can really run. Like, he can run. Justin Herbert is a guy that ran four five at the combine, four five nine. 
And he's, it's just, he doesn't choose to. But when he opens up and do, does it at times, you go, woo, man, he can go. And he just doesn't do it enough for my, for my liking there. But yeah, he torched them and he put the Dolphins, his talents alone, uh, and some of the answers of the offense put the Dolphins in a little bit of a tough spot. You know, the Dolphins, we know, like the blitz, right? And send pressure and people at the line of scrimmage and, you know, bring more blitzers than you have with blockers. I think there's two things. They didn't do it as much in this game, and I think there's two reasons why. One, they realized, uh-oh, like early on the first two drives when they did it, the Chargers had a few cool little plays where I think they went, uh-oh, those are kind of cool and creative. What else do they got for us tonight? We better be careful doing that. And then I think the other thing is, too, you, he, he is a great pressure thrower. And I think he's a great man-to-man -man thrower, as we just described with everything you just said. I mean, it's people not open. He still hits it. And they had a size advantage at, at, at the receivers compared to the Dolphins' corners. The Dolphins' corners are small other than Xavier Howard right now. And I think that between all of those things right there, he scared them out of their – normal approach a little bit as far as being as aggressive as they usually are because I think they said "Woo, the offense has answers he doesn't care when he's under pressure and we can cover guys downfield in these blitz looks but he's gonna throw it on the dime money back shoulder or fade and we're gonna be like well we did everything right except we just can't stop that perfect throw and I think that alone got the Dolphins a little bit out of their normal attack on the defensive side of the football and then they played a little zone off of that and of course as we've talked about he's very smart and reads coverages the right way and he he can pick you apart in zone as well yeah what'd you think about how the Dolphins play this because you've uh -huh. mentioned before they're a little blitz happy yeah exactly at times. exactly you saw that in my notes a little yeah. bit where it just I, like it wasn't the first time you've said this no, about this defense no I know I know it wasn't and then this one is a game where it made even less sense to me unless I know what you're gonna do what you do right and okay hey you're an aggressive team that's fine but at some points, you got to tweak things a little bit. The thing that kind of jumped out to me, especially like early on in the football game and in the first half, I, I talked about it. You know, a lot of like five man fronts, a lot of bear front. And I'm going, you're playing the Chargers. They can't block anybody. Why, why are we worried about the bear front and being overpowered? And then why are we rushing five against one of the worst protecting offensive lines in the game right now? And that, to me, was something that I thought they dropped the ball on that a little bit early, and that's what the Chargers moved the ball, I thought, on a lot of those looks. One thing that I found kind of common early on in the game is when the Dolphins rushed four, they won the play. When they rushed five and six, they lost. Hmm. You know, and it wasn't every play. I know there's I'm, – I'm not speaking in totality, but for the most part. And my feel's usually right with those situations. You know, those guys, Christian Wilkins, they couldn't block him. They, they didn't need to have a five-man front. Jalen Phillips – they could not block him. They did not need to have a five-man front. And that, to me, was something where I just go, hey, I know you're going to do what you do, but you know, according to your opponent every now and then, you got to tweak it and adjust it and go, wait, we don't need to go all in this hard in this game. And I, I thought that was a little bit of a mistake by them. A couple names you mentioned there, Jalen Phillips, Christian Wilkins, a yeah. big butt award winner. Both of those guys have won it in the past. Highest honor you can get as a defensive lineman, of course. But <laughs> everyone mean, knows the, that. The, the career's over. Pete, Chalk it up. Pete texted in the thread yesterday yeah. to all of us. He's like, I haven't heard a whole lot of people talk about Bradley Chubb. Uh -huh. Did he show up at all uh -huh. on film? He, I mean, not to where his money, his draft status, the biggest trades, you know, of the season. Like, not to that point, no. Is he a good player? Sure. Does he even remotely pop as much as Christian Wilkins or the other edge rusher, Jalen Phillips? No way. Mm. You know, and that's to me where I'm going to be interested to see where this goes. He's seems he like is, a problem, doesn't it? You it, just it, traded for him. You paid him a lot of money. Paid him a lot of money. I know, and you know, I don't. I know he's dealt with some injuries, and maybe he's not 100. percent And he is getting you know used to a new defense. And okay, we'll give him a little leeway there. But it's just the the you know me. It's the look of the player. I don't even care about stats and all that. You know, Jalen Phillips. I don't care what his stats look like. He was in the backfield all game long. I know. I think he ended up with one sack. Oh, gosh, he had a handful of pressures. He f***ed up a lot of run plays, right? So you know I'm big on the F the play up stat. He does that a lot. I don't say that about Chubb. And, you know, that, that, that's always a little disappointing. And I, you're right, it's going to pose some problems here for them. That's a big money they put to him. And you're going to have to pay Wilkins big money. And Jalen Phillips, I know it's only year two, but it's looking like two years from now, you're going to be paying him a lot of money too. Mm. I mean, he's, he's a superstar. He can beat anybody.
So uh, I did not understand that approach. But, you know, Herbert, back to your point, you know, he'd put them – his skill set alone – put the Dolphins in some tough spots too. You know, even to compound the spot, I, the point I made about the four-man rush. You know, there was a point there too where, yeah, you're getting there, but he's getting out of the pocket too, right? So I, I think they, then they got frustrated with that and we're like, well, let's send five so he doesn't have as many lanes to get through. And again, to me, again, that's why he's one of the five best quarterbacks in the game because things don't have to be good and we still sit there and go, it looks good. And that's when you're special, and he's he's that kind of special. As impressive as Justin Herbert was and the Chargers' offense was, I think their defense was almost equally impressive because we have seen this Dolphins team run up and down the field on a whole lot of teams yes, out there. We, we mentioned it last week. Even though they didn't score a whole bunch against right. the 49ers, it was there still were guys open. Exactly. Tua just was off he was in off. that game. Right. So were there as many guys open, and was it all on Tua's shoulders why they did not have a better game offensively no, this no, time? No, it wasn't as – it wasn't wasn't as oh Tua centric as it was last week, right? I mean, last week, as we said, you know, which is crazy because you can make the argument ten to twenty eight for Tua. You're like, oh, it definitely was all on him, but you think it was less all well, on him? I, I think it was less all on him. You know, there's still some plays where certainly you look at and you go, come on, first play of the game, Tyree kills man to man with a low he go, it's gone. It's a seventy yard touchdown. He underthrows it. You know, had the post down the middle, right, to Tyree Kill. I mean, he's gone. And for some reason, he threw it really early. And the ball landed at, like, the 34-yard mark. Post routes aren't completed at 34 yards. So Tyree Kill was, like, just coming out of his break and just hitting that top speed of, like, oh, okay, now I'm pulling away. And he turned around, and the ball was hitting the ground. You know, so I don't – he definitely left some – some yards and some plays on the field. There's no question about that. But, you know, not as much as the week before. Yeah. You know, this week, some of the complete incompletions and things were, well, that's pretty good coverage. You go, I'd like him to give the guy a little bit more of a chance, right? We saw some of those balls, like, on the sideline and stuff that, like, went out of bounds and he gave the guy no chance. You know, I didn't love that, but it wasn't like, oh, he's open and that should be hit. You know, that's what we saw last week. Mm -hmm. This week was a little bit more of like, no, this was a good defensive game plan, and they really took away and posed some problems from the offense where they're going to have to adjust a little bit. Every playoff team in the AFC is now diving into this tape. Yeah, and yeah, what 100%. the Chargers did. It's 100%. exactly what you did right. yesterday. Yes. What did you see? Well, it, and, and it's um, a little bit more man-to-man -man than I think p teams have played them for. And I think the especially in first and second down. Right. So early on in the game, it was kind of just regular man to man. And, you know, what did it do? It took away all the, hey, the quick screens, the RPOs. None of that was there. So he was very flustered. The offense was flustered in general by that because he's going, wait, I'm doing the run fake or I'm supposed to give the ball off. And, you know, there's an extra guy in the box or that backside linebacker is being aggressive, which my rules are now to pull the ball and throw over to that vacated area. But when he would pull the ball, they were like, oh, no, no, we're, we're not playing zone today. We're going to be right here on them. And so now that quick slant over the middle off that RPO, oh, that's not there. Oh, the quick out route. Oh, damn, no, that, that's not there. That's too dicey. It's too risky to throw that. Oh, the quick guy in the flat. Oh, boom. That's, so they took away the first and second down easy completions through man-to-man. -man. But the cool thing was as the game went along, it became a little bit more of like a combination coverage type of thing. And where they would play – cover two to one side and it might be true to zone or two man right so okay we got a bunch of guys over there to kind of stop the passing strength with all the receivers and the tight end are and then the back side they would just go you're playing man to man hmm. you know bump and run play inside so they can't throw the backside slant and you play man to man and then that backside safety he basically like played like if it's one of those guys from that cover two side cross and run a deep cross, I'm here to stop that. So that was a cool little twist they had. And, you know, cover two sometimes and then two man with this backside man and then the backside safety looking for people to cross that way, that gave them some issues. And it's going to give their RPO and their play action pass game an issue. And what it did too is it goes, no, no, you're going to have to throw routes into tight coverage on the backside. And – you know, you're going to have to make plays that way. We're not just going to let you, like, your offensive coordinator spread our zones and do all that, and then you just find a nice big hole. 
last touch the touchdown he threw to Tyree Kill, the go route. Same type of thing. They didn't play two man to the front side that time. That was a time where they rushed five, which you know I don't always love, but rushed five, played cover three zone to the front side, right? And had it all covered up, but they left the backside guy man to man. Tua made a great throw on a go route. Boom, touchdown. That's the risk you take, but I think it's like the risk is worth the reward. Hmm. A little bit. You got to take some risk against them. Like we talked about, it's too good of an offense to just think we're going to sit back and do what we do. You got to take calculated risk. That was the one they took yeah. throughout the night, and it paid off big time. Teams have just been too scared to go man to man with. I, Hill I think a and little Waddle. bit. Two of the fastest receivers. I, exactly in football. right. Exactly right. I think it's 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 a little scary, but I think you know what too. You can become a little comfortable as you start to go. Wait, when they have three receivers to the right and Hill or Waddle on the backside, it's a limited route tree. It's a slant route. It's a go route. Right, it's kind of like that to where I think they start to say, "Hey, play a little inside. Don't let them run the slant." And yeah, you might have a fade or a back shoulder coming, so you know, be ready to run and go that way. And they just took their chances there. But I, I do think it's something you're going to see, you know, or you see a guy press them and then bail just to not let them run the go route, right? Uh, but yeah, they're going to have to have some new answers for how they play this way. Uh, we've seen them. The Bills a little bit, mm -hmm. and the Patriots in game one have a little bit better of a plan of RPOs than the rest. We'll see if this continues to build now that teams continue to get some evidence on how to defend it and stuff like that. I mean, maybe they have to run it a little bit better. That was one of the criticisms about the it offense was. after the game. Yeah. And the, the Chargers, I mean, the 92 rush yards that the Dolphins got in this game was the second fewest by any team versus the Chargers yeah. this year. Do you think they had more opportunities in the run game? Yeah, they, 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 um, and, and now listen, I understand the past game and everything's been working all year, right, Amin? Like, it's just like, it's been killing it. But I think this was a game where you go, yeah, we ran for nine on first down, and then on second and third we throw it, right? Or you run for five, and then they run for eight, and then they throw it three plays in a row. And you just go, eh, no, no, you were, you got to stay with it here. Or, you know, take the RPO check off a few times. There was definitely a few plays, and I see this in every game, uh, just a few RPO plays where I go, he pulled it, and I want to go, oh, if he gave the ball, the guy's going to run for 20 yards here. You know, so, yeah, th I think it's something that they can is going to help them out if they would just run the ball a little bit more, especially in some of these tough AFC East weather condition type of games as well. And it'll stop people from cheating to, oh, I'm not going to, you know, had that backside backer. I'm, I'm going to stay here to stop the RPO because I don't think he's really going to hand the ball off and all that. It'll give it, you know, a, a little bit more leverage or, or merit that way. So the Dolphins at the Bills Saturday night – cold could be snowy buffalo's favored by seven and a half i mean this is a this is a game where you know two bad games in a row for tua yeah chatter out there oh, is he hurt i mean how is he playing this poorly i mean the, the offense clearly cannot function with him playing the way he's playing right now no no definitely not he's got to play better you know and and he's got to take advantage of the opportunities that are there and that, that's the big thing you know you're playing teams now where it's yeah there's there's not a lot of wiggle room so you miss two or three bombs that were like supposed to be 50 yard passes or a touchdown and all of a sudden you go F the game's different well yeah you've you've missed some opportunities and I think that's the thing we've seen the last few weeks where you know it's just they we've kind of got spoiled all year long of wait great play design got them easy plays and then when they did have the opportunities down the field he's been great all year taking advantage of that but the last two weeks has not been the case and he has been off and it's not necessarily you know as I said on Monday I just don't even like the look of some of the throws as I said and I could tell he's not feeling it right now the ball's fluttering in the air a little bit there's not as much pop as there was a few weeks ago and I think there's a little indecisiveness because he's getting played a little bit of a different way the last few weeks and things aren't as easy to where that's hurt him. And it's, 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 he's thrown to the most open receivers in football. It's, it's not even close. He missed, what, three games, two games? And he's got like 20 what, more attempts to 20 more attempts, 20 more completions like five to more. five yeah. yards more separation, right? So he's by far that. The other weird thing with him is like, the more protection he has or the longer he has to throw the ball, the worse he is, mm. which tells you, again, when the RPOs and boom, the quick throws aren't there, oh, he has to stand in the pocket and make throws. This is not his cup of tea. So, yeah, I'm going to have my eyes on Tua on Saturday night for sure. In the wind, in Buffalo, arms looked weak. He's been off as of late, and now you're going to play a defense that usually is creative and knows how to take away your tricks. 
So it's certainly something to, to kind of tune in for. And protecting Tua, you noted in your notes too, they, they do have a little bit of trouble with that when the RPOs when are they, not working. Exactly right. When they got into the game of, wait, we have to drop back now because we're behind and and now we can't fake the speed sweeps and do all that stuff a little bit because it's third and whatever or it's an obvious passing situation and no one's worried about us running the ball. Yeah, now – that doesn't allow the offense to protect Tua. And they're not a great pass-protecting offense. They've been great this year protecting because of what we're talking about. The play actions, the RPOs, all the movement, as we've said a million times, right, makes everybody go, wait, oh, here comes the speed sweep. Oh, wait, no, he held, he kept the ball. Now let me pass rush. And that's allowed him to throw from a lot of clean pockets. But, uh, yeah, I would think that – with Buffalo, New England on the horizon, he's going to see some things that are going to, you know, stress that that system a little bit. That's a really good game. So yeah. is Chargers versus the Titans. Chargers favored by two and a half there. Trevor Lawrence just carved up the Titans defense. That's one where it's just like, man, Titans are teetering. And if they get beat, blown out in that game, that's that's tough times. For them. Definitely, it's a which a, is possible. It could happen. It is. You know, the, the 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 Titans. Yeah, I mean, I'm surprised by it. They blew the game last week. I just kind of watched that game back real quick. I know we're not going to hit it on it today. Yeah. But you know, they turned the ball over three times in the first half. Really, we're controlling the football game. Blew it that way, and then they're they're for the second year in a row, and especially right, they're ravaged by injuries once again. And the secondary, the defensive line, the linebackers, and that's, yeah, a little concerning. Um, and, yeah, they're going to have their hands full against uh, this crew, that's for sure. So that was a meaty breakdown of that game because okay. Chris looked at both sides of the ball, offense, defense, for both teams here. As we move on to the 49ers, another surging team here, talk about the Chargers out in the West Coast. Uh, 49ers destroyed Tom Brady 35-7. You already know that. Brock Purdy got a win as a starter, his dad crying emotional in the stands one of the coolest stories from last week yes in all of uh, the nfl but <laughs> this is not about narratives and this is not about stories here if there's criticism to be had on a quarterback chris sims is going to deliver you it, know it. right you're not going to hold back i don't hold back just because a guy was mr irrelevant you feel bad that everyone's calling him that <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna crush him if, if he if he deserves it so brock purdy has been one of the stories some one of the coolest stories this year in the nfl uh, beats Tom Brady in this one. That offense looked awesome, and he looked really good, too. You mentioned it. Maybe more mobile than Jimmy Garoppolo, does some things that he couldn't do. Definitely can do off-schedule stuff and move better than Garoppolo. That's for sure. So when you when you took a look at the film, the story is that, like, this guy is awesome. Was he as awesome on his throw in his play on Sunday? Yeah, I, I think it's it's fair to say. You know, maybe it was is it as awesome as we've all tried to make it out in the media and all. Hey, the story's awesome. His play was really damn good. Did things fall the right way a little bit? Sure. Did he get a little lucky? You know, with they you know threw an interception and got lucky that they called pass interference, even though the receiver just fell down and they saw it out of the corner of their eyes. So they thought, oh, he must have had pass interfered. And you go, no, no, he didn't. The guy fell. He, he so you know, a little bit of that, right? First play of the game, misses a free safety blitz. You know, Ken O'Neill has, you know, been around the league too often. To, like, crown on the helmet to the quarterback's head. You thought you were going to get away with that on the first play of the game? Like, come on. But after that, I mean, yeah, everything was damn good. Damn good when you talk about a guy making his first start against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You know, one, you know, the athleticism for sure. Um, not making any major mistakes. And, and the big thing is, like we talk about with any quarterback, like, taking advantage of all that's there to be had right and they're not giving him a ton of opportunities but when he does get the opportunities he he's doing the right thing with the ball and he's being aggressive and making it happen I think that's the positive thing the biggest thing I would say in this football game more than anything is just the 49ers are rolling and Shanahan's rolling and as I said to you before the podcast if you told me Shanahan was next to Bowles like going like wait what are you calling here Okay, hey guys, he's calling this, so we're gonna go with that. I'd be like, it looks like that. He he had such feel for the Buccaneers' defense and their attack that they just they couldn't be right. And then it's just not a Buccaneers' defense that's what we've seen the last few years. So between all of those things, and I'll get into specifics here, that's what led to a, a 35-7, you know, ass whooping there by the 49ers. I want to get into more of what Shanahan yeah. did here, but let's close the loop on, on Purdy. Sean Danner 6 says to you, with Purdy, 
Is he better throwing accurately on the run than Jimmy? We've said he's a little more athletic now, and we have a graphic on that. And so those who are listening, I will describe it to you. When scrambling on the run this season, Jimmy Garoppolo. <laughs> this is funny. Four of nine. The whole year. Four of nine for 68 yards. Does have a touchdown. Yeah. No interceptions. Uh, Brock Purdy when scrambling this season. Five of seven, 42 yards and a, and a pass touchdown. It almost just says it all right there. I mean, one guy is nine times the whole year. The other guy is seven times in a game and a half. His movement is definitely an advantage yeah. you know, that they did not have. And his scrambling. I mean, hey, his touchdown run was a great run. It was a great cut he made. That was what it was. Not, he didn't have a pass touch. It was a rush touchdown. It was a rush there, touchdown. So right, to right. That. But even, you know, he had a, a play – uh, it, I think it was before the half. They run a bootleg, right? That's another th- element of the, the – they're, they're running more bootlegs with him because he's so good at attacking the edge, and he is good, uh, Papa Stu 80, to your point, at throwing on the run. And then he's good at – like he had a play where he had the bootleg, he came off, Shion Trianko was there, he didn't fool him, but he makes a miss in space, resets his feet – and throws like a, a like a twenty yard out route. I believe it was to Debo Samuel before he got hurt there. And you go, damn, that was like high level, high level shit there. You know, so he definitely brings that element. And within that element, it's gonna help their run game. The bootleg thing with him is gonna help the traditional run game because mm. now teams are gonna be a little more worried about that. The backside DNs going, I gotta kind of stay home because they run boots a lot and he can run around the edge. I think it's only a matter of time before we probably see a read option involved in the things too, right? Because he's 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 gonna be able to keep the ball off of, oh, I faked it to McCaffrey, the DN crash, and he's gonna be able to run for 15, 20 yards. He's that type of athlete. Um, but you know, the big thing is is Shanahan just was not gonna let them be right. That was the big thing. One, hey, yeah, they're better. And then, like, when Vita Vea got hurt on the first drive, and I don't know when the injury was. Early, it seemed Yeah, like. it was, I, I think, it four was right. It was four, I was going to say, it was like, because as soon as he came out of the game, they threw the ball early on, and as soon as he came out of the game, they are like, he's out, let's run the ball. And they started gashing him there. But, you know, one, you know, they, they wanted to play five-man fronts. But when you play five-man fronts, what happens? The middle of the field's open, and so Shanahan had some good ways to throw the ball there and expose that. So then they'd get to the four-man front because they're like, oh, man, Shanahan's finding ways to find the hole in our zone when we rush five and do that. And then you get they get into four-man fronts, and they'd open up a hole in the run game the size of a fucking Mack truck. Mm-hmm. So then, you know, so Todd Bowles was a little bit of a no-win situation as far as I don't know what to do. And then he'd get into some six-man fronts where he's like, I'm going to get a six-man front, and we're going to have enough people to stop the run. And if they drop back to pass, we're just going to pressure him, and he's going to have to make a quick decision. And then Shanahan's like, well, okay, sure, get all in there, sure. Come on down. And then what's he do? He puts Ayuk on the edge or a Kittle on the edge a little way from the line of scrimmage, and they block everybody down, and he tosses it out. And now you go, well, we got six down linemen in there and a linebacker in the middle, so we got seven guys inside the tackle box, and he's just smushed us all in there, and now there's McCaffrey or Debo Samuel on the edge with us limited guys, right? So Shanahan really was all over it from that standpoint, and then all over the double mo- the touchdown passes. Ayuk and Christian McCaffrey, he just he just had great feel. The first one to McCaffrey, all right? He yeah. throws a little slant and go for the touchdown up the left sideline. And this is another problem they pose for you. He knew it was coming, Shanahan. He just he, Through his studies or whatever, and Todd Bowles has a history of being aggressive, as we talked about before. He got in this situation. He goes, third down, we're kind of fringe field goal territory. He must have had feel of like he's going to blitz us. So he keeps George Kittle in at the running back position in shotgun to have a real blocker instead of a running back, right? And he puts McCaffrey out. Now they bring the all-out blitz. So the corner's going, wait, it's a running back. It's all-out blitz. They're going to throw it quick, right? Shanahan knows they kind of are going to think that. And McCaffrey runs, oh, fake the quick throw, boom, up the sideline, touchdown, right? So that's like knowing your opponent and then knowing the psychology of the DB. And then the second deep touchdown to Ayuk, double move, he's already 
thrown two curl routes to Ayuk on the drive. So the corner has seen run to 12, turn around, come back to the ball, catch the ball. Okay, it's a simple play. It's a rookie quarterback. Of course they're running curl routes. So he calls a play that looks exactly the same again. And what does the corner do? He's already going, well, he ran the curl on me twice this drive. I'm fucking gonna, not going to do it again. Boom, hits the brakes, restarts, boom, touchdown. So Shanahan's feel for the defense, the moments, the psychology of the defensive coordinators was on full display, let alone the creativity is, is off the charts. So you've hyped up uh, Kyle Shanahan. And by the way, Papa Stu asked a question that you kind of answered there about adding McCaffrey and what that allows them to do. I think yeah. you gave an early shout-out to Papa Stu there. I, I, it was I did. Sean Danner with uh, the first question Oh, my there. bad. You my my, my confused bad. confused your homies. My bad, Sean Danner. I didn't mean to. You're right. I, I didn't. So oh. I did not mean to do that. But I want to get to this one. Uh, and I, I do want to hit one thing on there. Off of what Papa Stu said, real quick. Okay, you want okay. me to read the question there? Yeah, have you read, seen read significant it. differences in how Shanahan provides his quarterback answers versus pressure since adding McCaffrey? As good as their weapons are, his impact as a safety valve when the quarterback is hot seems like the best they've had since 2017. He, you're spot on, Papa Stu. All right, for the second time, even though I gave you credit the first time, you didn't <laughs> deserve it. Should have gone to at Sean Dan or six, but he he is spot on. One, it's a West Coast offense, so there's always plays for the backfield coming out, of, and like they're true, not even checkdowns. They look like they're checkdowns, but it, all of it's just bullshit window dressing to get the guy underneath in the coverage they want. So it's a real part of the offense that's going to help out. And here's where this leads me to the point I wanted to make too, is they're – there and you've heard me say this about them before, but it's it's a different level now with the with McCaffrey in the group. Their twenty one personnel and twelve personnel is really going to put teams in a bind. It really is because when you can run the ball the way they run, and twenty one and twelve, you know, again, two backs, one tight end, or one back, two tight ends. You know, those are usually run the ball traditional when we were growing up offensive sets, right? You know, and the teams don't do it as much anymore. But so you're in there and you're getting gashed by the run and it's a great run team and the O line's starting to come along. So now what do you do if you're Todd Bowles? Well, damn, I gotta get five D linemen in there. I gotta play a five man front. I gotta play a six man front. And as soon as you start to bring that personnel in, what does Shanahan do? He goes, Okay, get to empty shotgun. And now you're, you know, in a formation where you go, Well, they should be in a running set. But now they're split out, and Kittle's awesome split out, and McCaffrey's awesome split out, and Juszczyk is awesome split out. And then you got Ayuk and Debo Samuel. So now you go, oh, shit, we brought in the extra D lineman, Carl Nassib, to stop the run, and now they're going to throw it for sure. And we don't really want to rush five, so now we're going to ask some guys that aren't good in coverage to drop back and play underneath coverage. And that really puts you in a bind. And that's where... Uh, Papa Stu, the McCaffrey thing is going to make things really tough on, on defenses. It's all working together. A really talented offensive roster with a really, really bright head coach yep. and offensive play caller, which leads me to the last thing that I want to mention oh, here. Oh, good. I'm glad you're going to do Austin this. Austin Gale uh, tweeted out. He's uh, prominent in the football Twitter community. Yes, he is. He's done a lot of things in, uh, in his This is a good uh, thought by Adam Austin Gale. He goes, the only quarterbacks that I would choose over simply having Kyle Shanahan as a head coach offensive play caller, Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, Joe Burrow, Lamar Jackson, Dak Prescott, and Trevor Lawrence. So he's basically saying that if you don't have one of those quarterbacks, give me any other quarterback – but definitely give me Kyle Shanahan first. Yeah, it's it's an interesting little exercise and thought, you know. And I don't I don't think our guys is too far off in that thought altogether, you know. It, he's not, uh, and Shanahan is he's special. And to the point you made, well, if that's the case, right? Yes, the point I made, right. if, that, if that really is the case, and if you believe that tweet that there are only a handful of quarterbacks, you might debate which names belong in there and which don't. But if there really are only seven or eight quarterbacks that you would take over Kyle Shanahan, then he should be making twenty million a year. Yeah, well, I, because you know, because some of the quarterbacks not on that list right. are making that much money. No, no doubt. And if he's as much of a difference maker, which I, I think you could make the argument, I don't think it's that. I don't think it's, it's that crazy. crazy. It's not crazy. It's not crazy. You, I mean, you're, you're saying it right. And again, just just as we've said many a times, Jimmy Garoppolo is not a top ten quarterback, and he makes what twenty five yeah, million a year, twenty five, twenty seven, five. 
right? He's not a, you know, I don't think most of the NFL views him as a top fifth, 16, top half of the league quarterback. He'd be like that next little group right after the top half. But that is the going rate for a starting exactly. quarterback in the NFL. Exactly. So, I mean, your point is real. And I think we're going to be getting there soon. Mm-hmm. I do. The, the, those, like announcers for the number one game on NFL Sundays, it's, it's, it's gotten to a point where, yeah, I think that market's about to explode. And there is a few... I think Belichick's making north of 20. And I think Pete Carroll's making close to 20. Sean Payton was close to 20. You know, Shanahan's definitely double digits, millions. You know, I don't, I don't know where it is on that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, McVay, it sounds like he's around 16, 18 million now. Right? So you, I think your point is real. And then with the quarterback thing there, yeah, I mean. Yeah, do you, do you agree with those names? I, I think I do. I mean, the only one that I, I I guess I would say I definitely wouldn't put in there, you know, is maybe is maybe Dak. Trevor is dicey, but Trevor you throw in there because like he shows things where you go the future is looks fucking yeah. good, right? You know, uh, but but uh, I almost think Austin Gale might be a homie. You but, and you and uh, him think uh, very similarly. I, I he definitely has sent out some tweets before where I go, I, I agree with Austin yeah. and what he's saying there. We'll get to Dak a little bit later on. Yeah, I think that'll we be will. interesting. We got Dak's 40- really good. That's not a shot at Dak. Yeah. I'm just not sure he's in the class of those guys right there. Uh, we're gonna do Dak right now. Yeah, Pete says. So we're Boom. gonna move it up. So. Uh, so let's do it. We're we're changing the rundown as we go. That's what we can Look do at this. here. You, you got to audible. You got to you got to audible. Sometimes they play the bare front, and you just can't. You got to change the protection. When you go there, we go there. So well done, everyone in the back here. Let's talk Cowboys because you looked at that tape. Because you mentioned this Monday when we were done with the pod, and and we we saw this last year a little bit as the year went on. I was like, oh man, it's not quite as crisp for right. Dak Prescott. Right. It's just a little I've off. seen better. Yeah, right. We've seen better. And yeah. so you're like you're a little disappointed with what Dak did. You hadn't looked at the tape yet. Yeah. Well now you have. Yeah. And so when you looked at the tape, Dak, and of course it wasn't a great game for the Cowboys beating the Houston Texans by four, but when you took a closer look at Dak and his actual throws throughout the game, what what'd you see? Yeah, it, it's a little bit of what I've been saying lately. When we we hit it on in Green Bay a few weeks ago. You know, um it's just the Again, it's not that it's bad. It's not bad. It, it It's still good. It may have actually been better than you were anticipating seeing. I I, yes? I, th- I think so. Well, and and I think the thing is, I still see moments of going, that's that's who he is. Why aren't we doing that more? What's, what's the deal here? There's just inconsistencies in this game right now. You know, you take away the Minnesota game, Nothing's been clean or easy for him as lately. I mean, he's thrown seven interceptions in the last five games, and he threw none in the Minnesota game. So it's really seven out of four ga- seven in four games. And to me, again, too, uh, you know me. I'm not always the bottom line stat guy and all of that. Um, but just even watching the game live on Sunday when they would show replays of throws or whatever, I'd just go, man, ball just not coming out of his hand clean. A lot of like – you know, not spinning wobbler type of balls. And then also just balls that are a little off the mark where they might be complete, but you go, oh, man, if he hit that on stride, that guy's going to run for another 20 yards. So, it, again, it's Dak. I, I want to make sure that I'm very clear about this. It's good. But but I know what Dak's capable of. I've seen him have years and put together games where I just go – He's on fire. He's just striping it. He's throwing the ball amazing. Every time he throws the ball down the field, it's a completion. Boom. And right now, I feel like I'm seeing some throws that I go, a guy that's $45 million and that is a top 10-ish quarterback who I know can do this is not not hitting on all cylinders right now. I got, that's, what, that's what was piquing my interest in the game. So at plug-and-play 16 – is seeing the same things. He goes, I think Dak has great command of the offense at right. the line of scrimmage, but every week I see him miss three to five throws and miss badly, mostly high. In your opinion, what is up with Dak's inconsistencies? Yeah. He won't get past the Niners or Eagles like that, which that, is like almost word for word from your notes. Well, it, it, right? I mean, it, that's that's the point. And These homies again, are in your head Thank right you. Now. I, that's where they're supposed to be. They're <laughs> supposed to be my homies. But at Plug and Play 16, you're right. and that, That's what the point I'm trying to make. It's not bad. You said it right. I'm holding them to a standard. We're, we're talking to the Cowboys Super Bowl. And, like, this type of play, to my point, is not going to beat, to, to, and to, to our man's point here, is not going to beat the, the Eagles or the 49ers yeah. 
or the Bills or the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. Like, you know what I mean? It's just not that's not going to get it done. So why is it happening? Well, I think the the first thing is is mechanics, and we've talked about this before. Dak falls, and I've had this conversation with Jason Garrett since he's been here, and Jason has verified. And I know, as I've told you before, I've talked about it with Dak to know this is a little bit of a bad habit he kind of reverts into at times. And right now, he has the, and, you know, I, I, I'm not going to stand up, but the front leg lockout, right? Your front leg should never be locked out, never. And it gets, like, toe right to the target, which is odd in itself. But that's okay. I mean, he's the only guy I know that's like literally puts the big toe and points it almost like a dancer or a ballerina at his target, right? Mm -hmm. now, most guys, you just get your body lined up and you kind of step and it's more like your pinky toes at the target and then you turn into the ball and now you're big – after the throw, now your big toe is hitting the target, right? Right. So that's usually what you see. But he gets that with the front leg lockout and then added to that – it's a – anybody who's been listening to me, you know the creating of opposites, right, between the upper and lower half. So front leg lockout and then zero shoulder movement. So he gets like this, and then he just comes over the top of it because he's a big, strong man with some big hands, and he gets it done. But, like, top throwers in football don't throw the football that way. Justin Herbert, Joe Burrow, Mahomes, Allen, their front leg never locks out, nor do they ever get – way over the top of the ball, and they always get their front shoulder tucked in underneath their chin to the point where you see the nameplate on the back of their jersey when they're about to throw a football. Did that paint the picture the yeah, right way? Yeah. Right? So we're not getting that. And that, to me, is what I look at to be why the quality of the football is not what I have seen from Dak Prescott when he's really getting, you know, kicking butt. You mentioned that, too, and a little wobble, always a little wobble in yeah. his throws. And I was thinking about that, and you know, I, I think about at some of the top quarterbacks. And Peyton Manning, I think I remember it's like he didn't throw a real tight spiral. No, not you know? always. How no. much does that matter, and when does it matter well, for you? Yeah, it, it, well, it, ma it makes it easier on the receiver. It does. When you throw spirals, it can just, again, it's less moving parts. You can focus kind of on the point of the ball, and as you look at it into your hands, it just boom, and it sticks. And it because it's spinning, it kind of digs its way into your hand, right? The ball that is kind of that wobbly and not spinning, it just hits your hand like like a brick sometimes. You know what I mean? Where when Allen or Mahomes throw you one of those lasers or Bro or Herbert that is spinning like this, I mean, you almost you almost like have to work to drop it. It's like literally like a drill. It's like it's like coming yeah. right at your head, right? Yeah. And it's just like boom. I gotta uh, okay. I gotta hold this there. So that's where it's good. You know, but that it makes it hard to catch that way. It hard makes it hard to pluck the ball out of the air that way. And usually, again, when the ball is wobbling like that, you're you're doing something mechanically off. Yeah. Uh, that's that's what history would, would tell you. Good news for Dak, though, is that they have a very, very good running offense. Yes, they one do. Of the, one of the better in the NFL. Yes, they and we do. We have a graphic on that. I will describe it to those who are just listening to this podcast while they're driving around. So total rush yards um, and then rush yards by the quarterback. This is real interesting. So the Bears have the most total rush yards, but you got 37% from from Justin the Fields, right? right? So right. Ravens are second, but you got a lot from Lamar there. And Eagles there, but you got a lot from Hurts. And basically, it's every team. Browns uh, you get a little bit, not much, 15%, though. But then you go down there to the seventh most rush yards in the NFL. It's the Dallas Cowboys only getting five from their quarterback. Right. Cooper Rush was not rushing a whole lot. No. Contrary to his name. <laughs> Seriously. That's Cooper what, Pass. That's propaganda. What fake bullshit is that? Exactly. <laughs> fake news, right? His name is fake news. Uh, but Dak doesn't do it do it either. And uh, you, the two running backs here, you know, you've, you've been a staunch supporter of Tony Pollard getting more run, and you had maybe, maybe one of the best compliments I've seen in your notes for this whole year about Tony Pollard in this game. Yeah. Uh, Tony, so, Tony Pollard's elite, right? And, you know, what, what did I write? I wrote that, you know, you want me to read it? Yeah, go ahead. You read it. I, 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 I you go Tony it. Pollard yeah. and Christian McCaffrey are the best dual threat running backs in the NFL. Yeah. I, because they're like, in space, they're amazing. You know, McCaffrey has more value and probably running between the tackles, but Pollard's no slouch. And that's the one thing when people are like, you know, oh, you, know, you want him to be the space guy. And I'm going to go, damn, he weaves his way through the trash. 
you know, better than Zeke a lot of the times. I know he can't punish you and do that always. But then, like, his ability to catch the ball out of the backfield from the true running back spot or his ability to line up at receiver and run routes, you know, I'm not going to say it's quite as good as McCaffrey, but it's receiver-ish regardless. It's to where you'd go, he runs routes like a receiver. Like, it's not – this is not a running back where we're like, you do these two routes good. We don't want you to do anything else. Right. There's nothing Tony Pollard can't do that way. And, again, you know, I, I don't know. Am, am I missing somebody? Is there somebody – you know me. I, I, I don't – I write these things and I'm saying them because, yeah, I follow the game and I'm obsessed with it all the time and I kind of write it just right off the top of my head there. But I don't think I'm wrong in that. You know, I gave it a quick thought. Is there anybody that jumps off to you? You know, Dalvin Cook is is good at receiving the ball, but they don't use him in the receiving game a lot, yeah. right? But he is good at both. I get that. Is there anybody else I'm missing that you would throw in that conversation? I mean, at the other end of the spectrum, you have Austin Eckler, who might be a better pass catcher than right. running so, back. Right. So, but that's that's true. He's in that conversation too. That's yeah. a good one. But that's a good one by you. You're right. He is. He's what he'd be in that conversation with those guys. The same type of thing. Exactly right. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's that's good. Aaron Jones. Maybe another guy that I throw right back Aaron in that Jones list there. Good. Right? So those would be four guys that I look as dual threats, equally as scary in the passing game as they are in the run game. And yes, Pollard is I, I just still think they give the ball to Zeke too much. I do. And that's I, Zeke's good. But having said that, exactly. Yeah. Having said that, and right. you said that before, and you're like, it's time to pass the torch to Tony Pollard. Having said that, in your in your notes, you go, Zeke's still good. He, he is. you still like some things I, you I see do. from Zeke. I, I, he's he still moves well. He still can run with power. It's just there's a few runs every game where I sit there and go, ah, I wish that was Pollard there. That would have been more exciting. You know, hey, it was a gain of seven, but Pollard might have split those two guys and gone for 60. Uh, that that's, that's the biggest thing. And to me, again, they can say all they want. They know Pollard's better. Anytime there's a big drive or a got to have it moment, 20 is in the game. But they are still trying to kind of tote the line a little bit because Zeke was he's, – he's a legend down there. He's the highest-paid running back in the game. So they are playing up those politics too. Yeah, and uh, you don't want to lose – you don't want to lose him if he's a leader in that yeah, team. Yeah, he's got a lot of value to the room, team. Exactly 100%. right. And there's no doubt. And, and, again, I don't mean to always sound negative on Zeke. It's just I think Pollard is really damn good, and he's in the prime of his career. And uh, uh, th that's where I, I root for it a little bit or root for him. So the Cowboys in uh, two weeks basically – faces the Eagles but they got the Jaguars this weekend yeah they're four and a half point favorite which is down from the 17 and a half points they were favored against the Houston Texans could be a bit of a trap game although you just had kind of a letdown game that's where it does help them from that standpoint you know right you know you, like you just got you you won the trap game so hopefully this make, wakes everybody up this is the best way you know, to to win the game, you probably should have lost. Yeah. So you don't have the ah, oh, I can't believe we lost. You, yeah, we won the game, but then the coach can still go. Hey, there's a lot of shit we got to improve. That wasn't good enough. And the Jaguars were awesome. The last Jaguars week. are they got talent. Yeah. They do. They're not again. The Jaguars still young and all that, but they are oh not going to be physically outclassed by oh the boy. Dallas Cowboys. Oh boy, you're going to be picking the Jaguars. <laughs> Here we go, cover. Jags. Here we go again. Uh, a theme of the year. Uh, that's good. I think that basically sums up all your notes. But oh, maybe yeah. one more thing, Columbo. <laughs> well, you know, I just wanted to end the last drive. We didn't hit on that. Oh, that's right. Right, you're right. The last drive, that was was special. Dak was special there. That was a big time throw. You're like, this is what I've been talking that, well, about. Well, that's my point. That's all I was trying to say. Like, I know this is what he can do. He's not doing that much lately, right? You know, and I heard a few people start to go, we need to throw him in the class of Mahomes and Allen and Burrow. And I want to be like, wait, did you watch the rest of the game? You can't say that. Or the game before that, you know? Or, you know, it just, there's, it, it's lately has not been sharp for, to say that. But, yeah, this guy's still a hell of a player. That was a big time clutch moment after making like the mistake of the game where you think it's going to lose, and then you go down 98 yards for a touchdown. Uh, pretty awesome. But to our man's point, plug and play 16. Yeah. If they want to get where they want to get, mm. it's got to be better from from him. You brought it full circle. Boom in that recap right there. Uh, so the Cowboys, pretty good running game. We just got done talking about Pollard and Zeke there. Uh, the Ravens have had that good running game in the past, and maybe it was the best you know, the non-quarterback running game that we have seen from Baltimore this year against the Pittsburgh Steelers, a two-point win. We want to take a closer look at how the, the Ravens, 
did that, and yeah. I, by we, I mean you. We, you did this uh, again. We're because, a team. Because I think, you know, and, and you've made this point, for Baltimore to make a run, it's gonna Lamar's going to have to be playing and playing well, yeah. but they have to have that running game. Exactly. And we haven't seen it, but we did in this game. Um, and so what did you notice? What stuck out to you the most about what the Ravens were able to do in this game that they haven't been able to do up to this point? I, I think the, 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 the biggest thing, or, or just the the – borderline state right right the headline statement i would make and we can get into a little of the details is mm-hmm. just that we can't forget about the ravens when they're healthy on the old line and they're running back running backs are there that changes their team you know i hate then you know people go oh lamar's gotta throw for more yards and do all that and i would be like well who who's who's he supposed to scare you with that here and well why just because he's lamar and you want to hate on him so you're gonna say that but yeah, they need him healthy, like you said, and they need this run game to work. And just to me, the, like like I wrote at the end, right, where I was just like, we can't give up on the Ravens. The D is solid, and when they're running back and O-lines are healthy, they have shown the ability to beat an elite running football team and run on anyone, right? And the Steelers have been good against the run this year. I really went like, man, with – Backup quarterback, not a dangerous passing game. I just thought, man, I don't think the Ravens are going to be able to run on this crew here. You know, but that was not the case. I mean, it was a dominant dom- – it, it started out as a little bit of a stalemate. But when we got in the second quarter, it started. the dam started to break. And the size and physicality of that O-line and then those running backs to go along with it started to really – whoop some butt on the Steelers I think that's an interesting point you make here sticking with the run game and you've heard that for years and the, the conservative coaches uh, stick with the run game might be ugly early but eventually we'll we'll wear them wear down, down. And, and that looks like what they did here because their first 12 games they had 19.2 rushing attempts per game they had 30 against the Steelers they had 189 yards on the ground there 6.3 per carry so as the game went on you said all schemes were working yes. for the Ravens' right. run game. What what were those schemes that were working and what might work going forward? For yeah, them? well, you know, and, and two, like, you know, I feel like we've seen, like, the one stretch of the year where I went, oh, their O-line was kind of healthy and they had some running backs to a degree. And that was the Browns, the Buccaneers, and the Saints, that little three-game matchup mm-hmm. where I went, ooh, watch out for that. And then the bye week came, and then Ronnie Stanley got hurt early in the Carolina game, and – you know, then Morgan Moses, I think, got hurt later in that game, and and Gus Edwards hurt himself in the Tampa game, and all that. But uh, the the big thing early on was just like, and I love these plays. You know, I love these plays where it was just like, we're going straight. We're not no scheme or anything. Oh, Cam Hayward, you're in between the guard and the tackle. Well, we're gonna double you. And then one of us is going to go up to the linebacker. And then, hey, the other tackle, we're going to double you. And somebody's going to like like double concepts. Man to man, just downhill, get bodies on bodies. We're big. We're going to move you. And then we're just going to let the running back kind of gain some steam and find a hole and go, right? We would call those like 34 double if I was in, in New England back in the day or playing for Josh McDaniels. And that was what kind of got going early. And – you know, the one thing you notice about the like, the Steelers is just nobody could get off a block. Nobody can really make a play. And as I got into the game and kept going, I was going, damn, I, I don't I don't think I've noticed anybody on the front seven of the Steelers. I haven't even remotely thought about T.J. Watt. You know, other than Cam Hayward, a few plays where it's like he almost made the play, it was like nobody was getting off a block or getting any disruption. So they were totally manhandled up front. I mean, if it weren't for, like, Minka and Cam popping at all, you'd go, I don't know who played on Pittsburgh's D today. You know? But th- it was that early on, and then became the second half, the pulling guard stuff, where they started to really have their success. Which was somewhat ineffective early on. It right? was. They could not get it going early on. The, the, the Steelers' movement up front and trying to slant some guys, it kind of clouded things and made it a little messy. Uh, but man, in the, in the second half, they got it right. And they just, it was blocked down, blocked down, two guys coming around the edge. I mean, just kill session. And they were like smidgens close on like two or three other runs where you're just like, oh, if this pulling guard just had his eyes in the right spot. This was going to be another big run. And they got four instead of like, it could have been 44. Mm. Um, so that's where, again, I just think the Ravens, when they do stuff like that and you see their front healthy, 
it's the second time this year it's happened to me where I'd got to wait. We can't forget when they're banged up in that area, they're just not the same team. And when they are healthy, they have shown the ability to overpower teams. And that's why I still hold out hope that they, you know, with Lamar healthy and they can be dangerous for sure. You're hoping at Mystic Raven 11 is hoping as well. He said to you, Ravens have two thirds of their 2020, 2019 backfield back still on rep counts, yep. both trending up right. with Lamar That's incoming. Right. He goes, watch out for the Ravens offense if all three gel by week 18. And we've said this before. Yeah, you know, the top six teams a couple weeks ago are like, wouldn't be shocked if they were in the Super Bowl. Ravens haven't looked as good. Lamar's been down. They're still nine and four. I mean, it's not that crazy to see them in the Super it's Bowl. Not, they can definitely be one of those teams that can upset some of the thing thinking we all have, which is going to be the final four, the final two. Yes, because – uh, them them healthy with that healthy running back and Lamar and all that and it's ground and pound and they control the clock and do that and then their defense makes you know some Raven turnovers and that and all of a sudden you're going wait they're not better than this team but they're up by seven late in the fourth quarter in the divisional round it looks like they might go to the championship game I mean no that's not shocking we see a team like that almost every year in the playoffs kind of make some moves and I'm, I'm certainly not going to count them out of that conversation right now I'm not going to say they're as good as the Chiefs the Bills or the Bengals sure but they're they're right off of that and they're they're scary if they can be healthy because of the the formula you're describing there and, and they got a yeah. favorable schedule here down the stretch well, too. They, yeah they're uh, at the Browns Saturday right Browns are favored by two and a half in that game. I'm a little surprised, but I guess it's the third string quarterback. Not sure what's going to go on yeah. there. That's a little scary. Yeah. Well, if they can run like they did, uh, it won't matter. Last right. week might not matter. Yeah. Um, so a uh, Raven still in the playoff mix, of course, at nine and four there. And we take a brief break here to reflect on the fact that we did this at the beginning of the season. We had 816 homies yeah. submit their playoff picks. Right. And Pete went through all of them, put them all into a spreadsheet was like typing away smoke coming out of his ears and so pete was like uh he was like hey we should uh, we should revisit those and see how the homies are doing so far right and so uh the good so far is that 95 percent of the homies had the eagles in the playoffs and that looks like they they thought it was going to be a lock and that looks like it's going to be a lock yes well it done. is right that probably was the most uh playoff pick team i would think i would think them are the chiefs maybe chiefs yeah, yeah. 95 percent though is pretty high you're right probably chiefs Probably Bills, too, were in the yeah, 90% yeah, range. I would think so. Uh, but here's the bad, though. Right. So the home, we got to point out the bad with the homies, too. We do it with the quarterbacks. We do it in your evaluation. The homies have to be able to take this as well. Uh, 34% of you homies out there, 275, had Denver in the playoffs. <laughs> yeah. Which is probably not going to happen. Not me. I yeah. didn't follow that trap. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's not going to happen. It's mathematically impossible at this point. Uh, 22 people had Chicago in the playoffs, which, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, they're probably in Chicago. I was going to say, take a fly. They're either Ohio State fans or Bears fans, one <laughs> yeah. of the two. Yeah. And eight people had Houston in the playoffs. Oh, and that those eight need to be drug tested. They, they but, were definitely uh, in Houston. We, we, we need to bring you in, you eight people. And on drugs. And we and we need to we need to do a, a, a big, time, <laughs> yeah. big time test on you. Yeah. So, uh, Pete. I will tweet this out under the name Chris Sims, and there's a link. So if you submitted your picks, yeah. you can see your name there. Yeah. You can see how you're doing so far. I, it's cool. I checked out the link right before you started. It's, 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 it's definitely worth the look, and good job by Pete compiling it all. And Yeah, I mean, we all want to be right. Yeah, so we'll, we'll call out some homies who yeah. are crushing it as yeah. we go on here who have some of these teams in here. Now, just 15 people had the New York Jets in the playoffs. Mm. And so at borderline right now, I think yeah. they're out right now, right? They I don't are. think they're in. Or they're out right the, now, the, but the, yep. but they're close. So those 15 people could be geniuses. Um, real quick, because we got this uh, this tweet, and I saw it yesterday, and it will give us a chance to talk a little bit about this. Bompa LD 6 said, love the pod. What are the implications of Mike White getting banged up by the Bills. Seems to me the Jets have put themselves in a very difficult situation at quarterback by benching Wilson. Now, Robert Sala today said that Zach Wilson will be the backup. The backup. I, I guess he's Mike saying Mike White's going to start or Healthy play. enough to I play. I think he's going to play, right. Okay, all right. right. But, but you got some thoughts on this, and you've had some thoughts on this for yeah, a while. Yeah, well, I mean, in one, you know, like, I feel like they're backed into a corner here. If you don't make them the backup for this week, then 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 you're basically telling everybody it's over. It's over, which I'm not sure it's not over anyways. It, to me, it's still one of the weirder things in the sport right now. It is, and I don't I don't know where it goes, and I don't know like what to believe. Are they trying to 
actually work Zach Wilson in? Do they want it to happen? Or are they just trying to save face there and then keep value of his trade there and like to move him on in the offseason? Either way, to me, it has the feel of a situation that's not going to end nicely. The, the, the way they have handled the situation, maybe the way Zach has handled himself too, and with some players, I think, who talk too much, the, the fan base doesn't like Zach Wilson. All you got to do is listen to local New York radio, and nobody likes him. And I said to Mike Florio yesterday on PFT, when I was at the gym on Monday evening around like 5 o'clock, 5.30, I mean, I had two fans come up to me and like, hey, I love your work. I don't necessarily agree with your Mike White, Zach Wilson stuff. You know, us Jets fans, we they use these words. We hate Zach Wilson. Hmm. I hate? And I was like, wow, hate? And oh, they just, we feel like he's a spoiled brat. And, you know, he said no at the end of the press conference. I was like, man, I'm going to start holding everybody as accountable on their press conferences as if they're holding the hint to that. <laughs> but... It, to me, it, yeah, that's where I just – I don't know where it's going to go. It's really interesting. It really yeah. is. I mean, the franchise quarterback, number two pick of the draft, ends the 2021 season on a good note, gets hurt, training camp, comes back, a very tough situation, as we discussed, has to play like seven of the top 11 defenses in football. They go five and two, and the fan base is rabid to get them out of there. They bring in a Mike White, who's done a good job. I, I get that. But against three of the, you know, or two of the three poor defenses in football. And in two of the three games, they can't get in the end zone. But we love him. It, that, it just doesn't make sense. And now, hey, and he's done a good job. And he, he has shown that maybe he is that guy that has the chance to be a bridge quarterback or a quarterback. They're going to have to pay him after the year if they want to keep him. Yeah. But I just don't know where this goes. That's my point. Right. And I feel like it just is like it's a it's a weird situation that, yeah, I think the Jets have kind of put themselves on a spot here where I don't know if you're going to get out of it. And you're going to put – and if you do try to, like, hang in there and, oh, we'll make it work, I think their thoughts in their own building – are not making up, matching up with the reality and the perception that's out in the rest of the world. They might be feeling like, okay, let's ride the wave. We're in the playoff mix right now. We're just trying to navigate this season, and what happens will happen in the future. It'll all work itself out. Right. But I think the thing is, is like, there's no bigger question for any franchise than who is our quarterback. Exactly. And who is our franchise exactly quarterback. Right. And do we have it right now? Right. And if we don't have it, what do we got to do to get it? Exactly. You know? so and now, like, now you're going to get another game here where you're playing Detroit, who everybody throws on Detroit. Mm -hmm. You're going to put up good numbers. I don't know if you're going to win the game but the numbers are going to end up looking like well Mike White's not the problem mm -hmm. so no one's going to ever do that right and that's where again where I go okay so 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 you're not going to pull the Zach Wilson trigger and go back to him this week yeah you know when is that happening exactly and that's where it just it seems weird and if I'm Zach Wilson I, I I'd have a hard time thinking he gotta be thinking I don't know what's going on here either and if I'm in Zach Wilson's camp, I'm not so sure. The rest of most of the league thinks this is crazy and that it's over. I'm just that's that's what I want to tell the Jets. Like, you know, I think the Jets are like, hey, what's the big deal? He's just working on his craft, and then we're gonna try to work him back in when he's when he's ready to go. Well, it is a big deal. Like you said, it's the quarterback. You're in the middle of a playoff race, right? He was winning games with you. And I know it wasn't great. You know, but but it's all that, and the rest of the league is going. What the hell's going on there? And everybody is. No one's buying. Everyone thinks that the Jets don't really like Zach Wilson. So if they're trying to save face and trade him, no one's gonna buy it. Everyone's gonna be like, no, you don't like him. Nobody thinks you like him right now. They think the team in the city has turned on Zach Wilson. So that's where I don't think their reality is met messing with the perception of everybody else, mm -hmm. which is going to become the reality in, in, in reality here soon sure. if they don't watch out. And it's human nat and nature, too, to, to close the loop. We, we don't like unresolved questions, right, right? right? And so if you're a fan base, you, you want to close the loop and you go, all right. Zach's done. You know, I don't want to have to, like, it's kind of uncomfortable thinking, like, what are, we're kind of in this murky middle. It's like, no, he's done. Mike White's the guy. Yeah. Hey, Mike White's doing well. Sure. So you want to you get on board that train. Right. Um, but how crazy is it that this could all be different if he had just said, 
yeah, I do feel like we let down the defense. I, I what know. if that really? What if that really set off this whole thing? I, I mean, it seems like it's a part of it. It does. It does. Of. I mean, it's it's all it's all the fans, and when you listen to the radio up here, it's all they can talk about. It's one that one question, one, which one wasn't comment even. where they said the press conference is over, and then they said one more question. Yeah, a throwaway question where he wants to just walk out the door, uh-huh. and definitely should have answered it differently. I get it, but no, when we're gonna hold the kid to the craziest answer we've ever seen in a post-game press conference and you know my thoughts on that question too i like we don't as like it was more of a test than a question it, it, right yeah. and people are like well yeah. he failed the test be like well are, is that what journalists jobs are right to test to right. see if the quarterback will say the right thing yeah. no we're trying to get information yeah, yeah it's a gotcha moment which is it's crazy if that gotcha moment changed the trajectory maybe for the better maybe for the worse who knows we yeah. haven't seen it yeah but of a franchise it's it's possible fascinating it really Um, is the carolina panthers for the most part have not been a fascinating franchise just kind of fascinating how poorly it's gone right but now that might be changing because they beat the seattle seahawks uh, two teams just like the jets who are kind of defying expectations but i don't know are they are they playoff teams panthers still have a chance here definitely and they have a chance because they ran all over the Seattle Seahawks. So real quickly, we're going to take a, a look at how they did that because we haven't given them a whole lot of love. No, we haven't given them a look in a while. And if they went out, they're in the playoffs. And they were my team <laughs> in the last two years where it was a little bit like Jacksonville where I was like, I see a lot of talent on this field. I don't know why they can't put it together. So here are the numbers from week 14. They ran it 46 times against Seattle, and they had 223 rush yards against Seattle, who didn't have their star running back, didn't have their backup, just 46 yards. But run game went entirely to the Panthers. And so what you what'd you see from them? Was was this just them beating up on a, on a porous Seattle defense, or are the Panthers – possibly able to do this against a lot of teams in the NFL. Well, I don't know if they're able to run for 200 and something <laughs> yards yeah. against everybody, but I think the formula can be replicated to a degree. And I do think that. I mean, here, here's the, the – like this is the, one of the coolest things the whole game. Their first field goal drive, the start the game, 13-play, 43-yard drive, took eight minutes, <laughs> seven minutes and 55 seconds. Like, What? Well, what were they going like a one inch at a time here? I and mean, that's a phenomenal in itself. That that that's like the case, you know. Eight play, twenty five yard driver, a field goal that took four minutes, you know. Uh, and then of course you got other drives that are you know ten min- or five minutes and all that. But their patience with the run game is the biggest thing. They have totally opted to go. You know, we're gonna keep the clock rolling. We're going to play defense, and we're not going to let our quarterback ruin the game. And that's what they're doing, and it makes a lot of sense, and I think it's the right way for them to approach. Now, you know, the offensive, the the patience is the biggest thing, and I think you saw in my notes. I mean, they weren't really gashing them in the run game. It wasn't like, oh, man, Seattle's in trouble. I kept going like, wait, when are the stats and the numbers going to (laughs) come? I really did. I was like, wait, I'm at halftime. They ran it. 20 times for 77 yards. Like, what? Are they really going to, like, explode like this? And then I'm in the third quarter, and I'm going, it's still nothing special, right? Hawk Strollager said, seems like the Hawks held the Panthers' run game enough in the first half. Then they lost Al Woods, and it all fell apart in the second half, surely being on the field for 40 minutes. (laughs) That's the problem. It was 39 minutes of time of possession was a factor, too. But which level of the Hawks' D was most responsible for the run game woes? Yeah, I I think, you know, it's it's the D line. The the Hawks, as we've discussed, there's no big-time D lineman. Chana Nubus is good out on the edge. Jordan Brooks is a good middle linebacker. You know, they got some guys that are solid, but nobody that can go above and beyond or just be dominant, right? We've hit on that a little bit. And that, that to me, I, I really, I think Hawk Strollager kind of said it right. I didn't look at one guy as getting gashed or being dominated. It's just the, they got in the fourth quarter. It's so many plays. They are worn out. And then they were down. So they started to play a few fronts where they're like, wait, we got to stop this and get the ball back, right? So now there's nine guys at the line of scrimmage. And as you know, oh, you break through the line of scrimmage and there's not many people there. So then, oh, wait, we got a 15-yard game. We got a 12-yard game. So that's a little bit what happened to them. Um, But, yeah, just between running the ball, short passes, 
and and just the patience with the run game, and then we'll hit on their defense here in a second. They're a pain in the ass, and those running backs run hard. And you know the O line is it's gotten a lot better from where it was early in the year. And and Sam Darnold's doing the right things. And I, I think that's how you can really kind of just button up their their offense. Yeah. What do you think of Sam Darnold? Hey, he's done like he looks good. You know, it's it's again they're not asking a lot. It's a play action pass and a bootleg and okay, we'll drop back and pass it here, but he's doing it just right. Hey, he's open, he throws it. It's close. Ah, coach told me to play the defense, we're gonna run the ball, I'm gonna check it down. And and that's what he's doing for the most part. And even their pass game, it's like an extension of the run game. Like LaVisca Chenault, he caught four passes. They were all like the you know, swing passes that were basically like toss sweeps. And then he's like a, a, a Mack truck at receiver, and he just roar and just runs through DBs, and you're like, that was a game of nine. They threw the ball three yards behind the line of scrimmage. I've always thought about him. He's probably like maybe a, a slower, less explosive Debo. Yeah, he's right? with more kind power of, maybe. You're with right. more power. He, I think he could be played in that element. Yeah. I wouldn't be shocked if that happened here at some point in his career where people start to go, wait, he, you know, we should hand him the ball. And he was at Colorado doing that. He did that at Colorado. They played him a traditional running back. So he certainly would be capable. Um, but, yeah, I don't know if there's anything more than that there. But I, I think we hit it all. Time of possessions, mm -hmm. all the attempts, yeah. just the toll the running game took on you. One guy on defense that you wanted to point out, though, for Seattle was uh, Tariq Wool. Oh, my gosh. He, he jumped just, off tape for you again. He just is like, DJ Moore can fly. He's got three rockets up his ass. He's running post, post corner routes, and Tariq Woolen's like, "Huh, it's a jog in the park today." Like, and you're like, "Damn, you're you're only staying in the hip pocket of the like one of the most explosive guys in the sport." Yeah, he 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 really you notice him on the field, not only with his look, but his movement and how close he is on making plays on the ball constantly. I mean, there was two or three balls where you you're like, "Whoo, Sam just got that one in there. That was dicey." Uh, so yeah, he he is he is amazing that way and yeah um, yeah I, I think we we had not but Sam's movement is a part of this too, and Sam's ability to scramble and I wouldn't be shocked if we start seeing because one thing that got going late in the game was the Ravens double puller run that I like right so you're in the shotgun and the center blocks down and the right guard and the right tackle pull around and you give the ball. And I wouldn't be shocked to see, oh, we, we faked it to that guy. And then there goes, you know, Sam Darnold start to be broken out. But, um, yeah, the Panthers just yeah. physical and, and staying to their game plan impressive. And why this formula may work is because the defense is pretty good. Ooh. And we mentioned last year, I, I, I said a lot. I don't know if you agreed all the time, but I thought it was a playoff defense last I, I was year, with you. Right there, a right. playoff defense. Right. When you see the, the defense and how they played against a pretty good offense in Seattle, yeah, obviously without their, their – star running back yeah. but still you right. know weapons in the passing game um what'd you see from that panthers defense you, i mean you said it right i was on that wagon with you last year too right the panthers were my team like if there's a team that can make the playoffs and nobody expects it's the panthers yeah. so and we it, wanted to be half right we we're like well the defense was a playoff defense. <laughs> yeah the defense it, it was i think ended up being top five last year yeah all right so the the big thing is here with wilkes i do think he simplified the defense right and i think within to your point is why I think he's realized like a little bit like, wait, I, missing some big people. I wish we were better at like run stopping. So he plays a little bit more single safety defenses. Let's get an extra guy down in the run box mm -hmm. where the last defensive coordinator was played more two and quarters looks, had too much movement up front at times. You know, as you always hear, that's 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 scary. You know, when you move and, hey, I want you to run to that gap, you know, six feet to your right, well, if they're blocking you that way, you're going to end up being 12 feet to your right and you're not going to be in the gap. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard to always be schematically sound when you play that style. Wilkes, I don't see that going on nearly as much. He's just going, hey, Derek Brown, you're big and explosive. Win that gap and that's it. Hey, hey, uh, Brian Burns, you're long and explosive and quick off the ball. Just win your gap. Linebackers, same thing. So that to me is where they've changed. He's taken the approach of wait, we got a ta we got talent, length, and speed. Let's just let these guys play fast and not overthink this too much. That would be the thing that I've seen that they've adjusted. And then here's the other aspect of that. You know, they have some freaky talented guys for sure. But the thing that makes that all work too, to me, and the biggest maybe shock of since I this is the first deep dive I've done on them in five or six, seven weeks really 
is the way the corners are playing. The corners are fucking phenomenal. Sorry, Kristen. They're phenomenal. J.C. Horn is phenomenal. C.J. Henderson is phenomenal. And they couldn't – Seattle, who's not a great running team, as we've always said, mm -hmm. and then without Kenneth Walker, they didn't really want to live in the run game a whole lot, and now they want to throw the football. And I'm telling you, there wasn't many throws. Geno threw for 264. They weren't outside on those two corners very much. Uh, so that, to me, is the other element that – is special about them right now. And you almost have to find other ways to get the guys to your guys the ball when they're matched up on other people. They're really, they're really phenomenal duo at the corner right now. Yeah, you you uh said Brian I mean you haven't even mentioned Brian Burns here, you know, Jeremy Chin. Yeah. You know, they just got they, they have got guys speed standouts on uh, on defense. You thought Brandon Smith looked pretty good it, too. Oh my gosh. I mean another freak long guy, rookie from Penn State. He got hurt early he did. ish in the yeah. game, had to right. come out. Yep. Um, Shaq Thompson, Frankie Luvu had a good game too. That, that defense has got names. They on got it. names. Yeah. They got guys that are athletically talented. That pop. The only flaw of their defense, like I said, is they just need another big guy. That that's been their problem is rush defense. And I think that's what got the other guy into. Wait, let me try this and move this around. He was trying to to make it work that way. But hey. You know, that Seahawks offense is creative. They're aggressive. I like watching, and we know those three receivers can go in Lockett, Metcalf, and Goodwin. And I, they had decent numbers, but they weren't really all that good. They weren't. And they and like I said, those numbers that Geno and those receivers put up, they were when they were matched up on as guys not named C.J. Henderson and, and um, J.C. Uh, mm -hmm. Horn. It really wasn't. Added to the fact that Lockett, Metcalf, and Godwin look at their final stat and then take 25 yards away from each of one, each one of them because they got 25 each on the last drive when the game was 30 to 17 and Carolina was just everybody was 20 yards down the field. So the stats were a little bit misleading, but that's the interesting thing about Carolina. Uh, that defense is going to be a pain in the butt with the way they're playing right now. It's just going to be can the offense do enough you know, to win the games because their offense, of course, it's, it's not real as explosive, and nor are they trying to be real explosive. And if Carolina wins out, as I said, they'll win the division. It's crazy. So that takes us to our Bet MGM Dark Horse Division winners. So we got a list of non favorites to win the division. Mm. Which one do you like the best? And so we have uh, the Bengals are not the favorite, they're plus 110. Ravens currently the favorite, minus 135. Panthers are at plus 375. Jaguars at plus 450. Tennessee is the favorite to win there. Tennessee's got a good jump on them. Although, who knows if that falls apart for the Titans. Uh, Cowboys plus 500. Got to catch the best team in football, the best record in football. And the Dolphins are plus 900 versus uh, the Bills, who are minus 1,200 to win that division. So, if you had a dollar, what's the best value, you think, right here? Bengals have the best odds, but I mean, are the, the yeah, best value. I, I, I think so. And they get to match up and play the Ravens, you know, mano y mano. Now, you know, they, they do have a little bit of a, a, a tough schedule, right? Um, they got Tampa this week, which, you know, Tampa's going to be pissed off. They got the Patriots the week after that. They got the Bills, and then they got the Ravens. So that's where it's a little scary, you know. So, But, but like, gosh, the way they're playing, yeah, I'd, I would still want to pick them. Mm -hmm. I would. After that, okay, I get down to – Dolphins and Panthers. You still think the Dolphins could do it? I I, I don't think the Cowboys can do it because I, I just the Eagles aren't going to falter mm -hmm. at least in my thought, right? I I the Jaguars. I don't expect Tennessee to falter anymore either. I don't. We'll see. So and, and the Jaguars are so all over the place as as I've learned the hard way this year. Yeah. I guess that's where I I can't get into it. Tennessee's two games up on Jacksonville. Yeah, right. And and um, they play each other one more time too. But week eighteen, yeah. But the to win the division, the the Panthers one is interesting in the fact that I mean, all they all, they they almost have the easiest path, well, right? You just or the most clear path. Well, they they do. They get to play Tampa head on. Tampa's got to play the Bengals this week, right? Tampa, I think we we're at the point here where I hope they can lose anybody. So yeah. we got to stop thinking like, oh, Tampa will get it. Like they can lose anybody. They got Arizona. They'll be lucky. They're lucky that Kyler Murray got hurt. They don't have to deal with that on Christmas night. Um, but I think when it's all said and done, yeah, I still feel the best about the Bengals. 
And then the Dolphins, I'll go with them because they have great talent. And it's plus 900. You get the best odds. Great talent, right. Two and it's in their hands, Buffalo. I guess, yeah. is where I want to say. It's yeah. in your hands to do it. Sure. So I guess that's where I'll give the, those two teams the, the edge. The action never stops at BetMGM. You can sign up now using the bonus code SIMS, your first wager risk-free, up to $1,000. So say you bet $100 on the Panthers to win the NFC South. Okay, hold on. Hey, I just bet the Panthers $100 to win the NFC South. Well, if you win, you'll get $375. Oh. But on that, if you lose, uh-huh. you'll still get $100 worth of free bets. Simply download the BetMGM app today. Hey, hey, wait. I just downloaded the MGM app. <laughs> hey, congratulations. You know, you could have also gone to BetMGM.com. Ah, uh, no, nah, I don't do that. I'm an app guy. And I hope you entered the bonus code <laughs> SIMS, your own name, to make your first wager risk-free up to $1,000. <laughs> I hope they like how we did that this I time. Did, we kind of changed it up. I did. You know? It was a good change We're getting up. late in the good. year, and you got you to gotta have a little variety that's now. right uh last but not least oh i like this variety the most prestigious trophy in all of sports in all of sports it right is. what did the nba just do they just did the michael jordan mvp now i do like that i did i was a big fan of that, that was cool although what what do you want to fucking say what i saw someone although tweet this and michael i agree michael jordan isn't no. the greatest ever well no but <laughs> were we really dying to name these after people you know, I, I get it. It's an honor, right? I mean, I but, but like, like Jordan needed more honors. Like, well, I, I think it's a good way to honor the legends of your sport a I, little bit. I would have rather it have been maybe someone we don't talk about all the time. I don't know. Right? Well, I want it to be the guy that epitomizes the MVP, and that to me is my. I've never seen a more valuable player to maybe any team ever in the history so now, of sports. So now, whoever wins the MVP. It's like, hey, you've won the Michael Jordan MVP. Congratulations. By the way, you'll never be as good as the guy that made that trophy. Or, or the, just keep working hard, trophy. and maybe you will be one day. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, LeBron's going. like, I'm still waiting. I have been playing forever, <laughs> and still no one says I'm the best. Uh, there are a few people out there. But the Big Butt Award, though, will never have a name. They will never, there will never be a Big Butt attached to it. No, nope, unless you, know. you got a Big Butt. That's true. Well, if, yeah. I, if I develop one one day, then you're right. It is Ahmed's Big Butt Awards right. here, uh, and it does have a song. I almost forgot that. So let's play that. Let's play the song. Woo. It is we that like time. Big butts, and we cannot lie. The big butt of the week. Oh. Awards. Time to give some love to these Woo. big guys. Some it, touches. Woo. It's a couple of sacks, forced <laughs> fumble. He's a butting superstar. And give it to him, Ahmed. One butt cheek. And this is why you're the big butt expert of the world right now. <laughs> <laughs> See, that I would be okay with. If every trophy had its own song, I'm cool with that. Yeah. Like the MVP, it's like, all right, we're about to award it, and then you play the song. Sometimes the I dream that he is me. Yes. Yeah, there we go. I would be all for that. Uh, my edge big butt of the week. We'll do that first here. Uh, that goes to a Philadelphia Eagle. Yeah. And, and when I said that, you named like three guys. I was like, no, you can give it to a lot of guys here. <laughs> yeah. We'll give it to Hassan Reddick. Yeah. Had nine pressures, which Woo. is the most by an edge player this week. Right. Um, but now has double-digit sacks, as you mentioned. And this is, this is historical. This is like a career achievement. Big butt of the week award. Tenth sack of the season. He is the first player in NFL history to have at least ten sacks with three different teams. And he's done it three years in a row. It's amazing. It is. Uh, he's been the... I got stuck and I think in a spot in Arizona where they weren't sure what he is and he's a hybrid and okay wait he had a the first few years there he wasn't you know he was good but not great so but do we pay him as a top tier pass rusher so then Carolina Matt Rule had experience with him at Temple he knows what he can do has another good year but they probably went damn we got a lot of young guys we got to pay in the future you know, Brian Burns is a really special pass rusher. Derek Brown, they're going to have to pay him. Uh, they got a bunch of other guys, too. And I, it seems like he kind of just was the odd man out there. And he goes to Philadelphia, and he's, he's, he's a phenomenal football player. You can't keep him off the field. You know, I don't think Philly wanted to play him as much as they do, but I think when they just see, wow, him in coverage and him rushing the passer, he's disruptive. He's good against the run. Um it's about time he gets paid by somebody here because that's a pretty special attribute that, that you just talked about. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see who he plays for next year. Man, I you know. <laughs> Do you think the Eagles are it? I mean, I don't know. What's their situation I, financially? I don't, I don't know either. You know, I don't think they're in the worst spot financially, actually. I think they got a lot of their big-time players kind of – they just Jalen Hurts is the only thing they probably got to worry about on their horizon a little bit here in the, in the near future. But, gosh, I'm just thinking about it, you know – 
Fletcher Cox coming to an end. You're not going to have to worry about that. Javon Hargrave, they're going to Javon Hargrave's been really damn good this year. They'll have to think about him. And then they have Josh Sweat, who's yeah. also been really damn good too. Oh, no, it could happen again. I, it, it, who knows? It could. But either way, he's going to go somewhere next year and be a, a butt kicker. My Detroit Lions. Uh, that was maybe. cool that you picked him. I, yep. I'm, 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 I'm glad you did that. He's going to like that too, hopefully. Uh, on the uh, defensive interior, D tackle big butt of the week. We're giving that to DJ Reader. Yeah, well, that's the a big Cincinnati one. Cincinnati Bengals stepped up against that Cleveland rushing attack, faced multiple double teams in this one. Uh, they didn't have them, the Bengals, last time they played the Browns, and the Browns ran for 140 a yards. Game, right. And there was a quote from a Jesse Bates after the game. He goes, quote, I mean, he's got two bum ankles, a messed up knee, tore his quad last year. It's crazy to see. And he gets double teamed every single play. Every. And he still makes plays. He's amazing. He's the best run-stopping D lineman in the game. He is. And, and, and you, like, he got back against, I believe it was the Titans game. And it was almost instantly they're they're a better team. He not only is awesome, you know, as a player, he also gives them a schematical advantage. He is I mean, something we talk about a lot. He's one of the best two gappers in the sport, right? Which gives them great flexibility now when you're playing running quarterbacks and stuff like that to play with a few guys and go, oh well, if they run this play, I got a guy over here for that gap and that, right? And that, that's where he's good, too. So and he, if he goes over here, I got another guy, and they're both named DJ Reader. <laughs> I mean, he is like two people. <laughs> he is, and he's he's he does not get enough credit. The one team, I, you know, it's just funny just why because we're bringing them up. But that was like the Rams. When I talked to some of those coaches in the offseason, even Kevin O'Connell, I talked to him at the Combine a little bit. It was like the first name they brought up. And I just – we, we thought we'd be able to run against the Bengals in the, the Super Bowl. It was just, damn, that DJ Reader. Ooh, DJ, we couldn't block him. We couldn't stop him. We couldn't move him. I mean, he's he's amazing. He is. And he when, when when he's healthy, they're a different defense altogether. Well, now he's got a big butt award. Yep. To he his can name. retire. Pay him $40 million a year now. <laughs> That's what he deserves. Uh, and that is it. We've uncovered new treasures. Yes, we have. New We're going to do a few plays on social. So yep. uh, check that out. And then. Um, Tomorrow, the Picks Podcast, Florio Sims, Mega Picks Podcast. I did go 3-0 and in my best bets last wow. week. I, I mean, we've been shitting on me when I lose all the other weeks. I'm going to give myself a little maybe, props Maybe you'll week. be like the Denver Broncos, like that offense finally started to get going. Oh, you'll end the year with some momentum. Can you pick somebody else better than that? You had to yeah. go with the Broncos? It's pretty similar, I mean, actually. damn. Unfortunately, this year. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, yeah, yeah. Oh, Pete yeah, saying Pete the, the Texans. Texans. Yeah. <laughs> I was more looking like I'm like the Chargers making a late season push here. That's what I was kind of looking like. I'm going to sneak in the playoffs. I'll give That's you. I'll thinking. give you Carolina. Oh, okay, fine. I'm Carolina. <laughs> I'll give you Carolina. All right, all right. Push. I'll ground and pound and keep playing defense. Here we go. Yeah. yeah. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed the pod. Ahmed, you the man for driving the ship as always. Going through my notes, finding out the things that are interesting to the homies. Homies, good job. There's some great questions today. Keep sending them in. We'll do our best to answer it all and, and dive into some of these subjects. Hope everybody enjoys the week. We got a good weekend, man. I can't wait. I mean, Saturday, a triple header. I can I sit on the couch and watch games and be That's a normal cool. human. You're going to watch all three games back-to-back. Back uh, my back. son has a basketball game, and I think I'm going to say, screw you, son. Mom's <laughs> coming this week. I'm watching the games on the couch. Yeah. yeah I think I'm going to have to do that. I think I'm going to pull the dad card this week. Um, but I'm excited for that. I hope everybody else is excited. Enjoy. Get all your holiday shopping done. Don't be like me and an idiot and wait to the last 48 hours. It never works out well. Ahmed, you the man. Clap it up. Clap it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for watching, homies. Hit subscribe to see all my unbuttoned videos. You get to see me, Ahmed Fareed, all the big player breakdowns, game breakdowns, player interviews, and my film analysis. So please subscribe. Chris Sims, Unbuttoned. Peace out.